the invitation. Um, I appreciate there's a very diverse audience, so I'm going to um, stick to the script. And I was, asked, I was asked to give a review of my career journey to Cambridge, something about my research, and then something about life in Cambridge. Um, this shows you the cycle track from my village. A lot of people, it's, it's a small town, a small city of Cambridge, and uh, a lot of people live in villages. And this cycle track is from my village to the um, Addenbrooke's campus, which I hope you've all visited. It's very interesting in medical research. And um, this cycle track actually contains 10,000 <coughs> nucleotide bases for a structure of a gene, the BRCA2 gene, breast cancer gene. It's very flat in Cambridge, you see there's no mountains, and in fact some of our edifices then are, are horizontal. Um, so, what um, I'm interested in then is in the immune system, I work on the immune system, and the problem I'm interested in is this one. Here we have a cell which may be infected with virus or some other organism, and when that cell is perturbed by an infection, it could be cancerous, it could be stressed, it puts up a warning flag say that it's stressed. That warning flag then has to be detected by another cell in the immune system, by a receptor. And this responder cell, then with this detector, then actually makes the appropriate response to the immune system. So in very simple terms, that's what we're interested in. Now, the, um, I started in the late 1960s when laboratories looked more like this. Um, we had these wooden test tube racks, some of you may be familiar with them, all the members of the audience. Through the 1980s, when I did most of my work, this was a mobile phone. Um, and now, most laboratories look like this. These are, this is, if you go to any laboratory these days, this is what people are doing. When my mother went to hospital, she said, uh, she'd never seen a computer, and she said, all these people were actually working on typing machines. You can't understand what they were doing after curing people with typing machines. However, most labs look like this these days. And I'm always surprised to see how, how few people are actually doing any bench work. They're all working on the computers. So I started in, in Birmingham, in medical school in Birmingham in, in the late 1960s. In, I, I, I learned bachelor's in my first degree. I moved to the genetics department in Birmingham to, to again study bachelor genetics. And then I did postdoctoral work in France, in, in Paris, in Gilles Surrey, working on again on, on bacterial genetics and looking at a particular model of gene duplication. But um, in the late 19 or, or the mid-1970s, it was it was um, a fashion then to move from work on bacteria to this emerging field of doing genetics on human cells, so the somatic cells. And it's amazing to me how this whole thing has advanced from early work on bacteria and bacterial genetics, which was in the 60s and 70s was the classical model, if you like. It was very difficult to grow human cells in great quantities and study them in the genetic field. But there became a revolution, I guess, in the mid-1970s with genetics of, of, of human cells and mouse cells, and also gene cloning. And I was working in a laboratory where the um, supervisor had worked on bacteria, but he was moving into animal cells. We were doing this in the same laboratory, which actually was a big mistake. Um, you tend to get contamination of the human cell very quickly if you're working with bacteria. Then I moved to, first of all, to Oxford, and I worked with uh, Sir Walter Bodman, who some of you may, may be familiar with. He, um, he was very supportive, and I think one thing I want to um, really emphasize is that when you're a young person in research, it's very important that you have a godfather or a godmother, where there's someone to support you, and to help you, because it's 
obviously extremely difficult, obviously, as you know, to do research and to thrive. You've got to find the right laboratory, you've got to find a super hard way to do this. And Walter Bobmer really helped me, and one thing he taught, taught me in particular was that it's better to be an optimist. I like this uh, quote from, actually this was the Chelsea football match, Avram Grant, in 2007. He said, it's better to be foolishly optimistic than wisely pessimistic. To paraphrase Einstein, as a matter of fact, who again was, was actually very optimistic about the life of research. So I then went to the Cancer Research UK, it used to be called the Curve Cancer Research Fund, and I did my research again with Waterfall, and he was then director of this institute. And I was looking at these so called MHC genes, and it's those genes that actually I spent most of my career looking at. I then moved after 20 years, uh, 17 years at the Imperial Cancer Research Fund in London, I moved to um, the Division of Immunology in the Pathology Department where I'm presently located. And I've um, now experienced working in a basic research laboratory in London and now in a university laboratory. And those of you who've gone between the two know that it's actually a different culture in the research laboratory. All your time is spent doing research. Um, you dedicate your you most of your time to that. So very little administration if you're lucky, and very little teaching. In a university course, we like to do some teaching, research, as well as administration. In fact, quite often we get given too much administration. Um, however, it's a, I wanted a broader perspective on um, rather than just a research institute all my life. And I was also, for the first time, I had to write grants, which again, many of you will be familiar with. So the MHC was the main topic <coughs> of my research then. And I like to quote this example of, um, the, in fact, it's the best example of personalized medicine, bar one, and that is the ABO blood type. So ABO blood grouping, as you know, if you need um, blood after an accident, or a medical procedure is personalized medicine in that you've got to have a source of blood which actually matches uh, your, your own. So this is unappreciated these days because people talk about personalized medicine as if it's a new thing, but in fact it's not. It's been around for a very long time. But the MHC is the second example of personalized medicine. If you need a transplant then, you need to have tissue which matches your own tissue. And it's a bigger problem than ABO typing. In ABO, there's only a small number of different blood groups which you can use. In tissue typing, you've got to have a precise match <coughs> of tissue, otherwise the transplant will fail. And it turns out that the genes that make these proteins on the cell surface uh, that I'm going to talk about, these MHC genes, are actually the most important for tissue matching. And they're highly variable between different individuals. And so we'll go on to discuss why that may be. So my role in the 1980s, when Walter Bob was setting up the laboratory, the first in Oxford and then in, in London, was to clone MHC genes. So we wanted to make um, DNA copies um, to see what the, the MHC genes look like. So at the same time, in, in Harvard, in, in the States, uh, there was a group um, Don Marley's group and Jack Stonebridge are working on the structure of MHC molecules. And we identified some of the gene sequences and they identified them the, the crystal structure and you've heard something about the crystal structure today. This was the first crystal structure of an MHC molecule. And you'll see that this is an incredible, it's a remarkable structure. It almost looks to me designed. Um, you can see that it's got a little cradle here, and this little cradle is where the, a little bit of protein, a peptide, is picked up from an infecting organism. And it's presented on that um, flag, on that um, on the cell surface, to another cell. So if you look down on the cell, into this cradle here, it looks like this. It's got a deep cavity. And when they first did these crystal structures, 
come and we often looked at the cavity and found that there was additional material in here which was not present in the sequence of this protein. And it turned out that that additional material was the peptide of the say, these amino acids, approximately 9 amino acids long, from the infecting organism. And that was being presented to the immune system. So when these structures came out, it made a lot of sense of how this molecule was working. It was picking up fragments of infecting virus or bacterium, taking them to the cell surface, presenting them to the immune system. So this is what it looks like, um, again, from the cell, from the immune cells, looking down on the structure. It's, you can, can't forget it because it looks like a barbecue grill with two sausages. And in the middle here, there's a sausage missing, and that's the um, peptide from the infecting organism. And that is being presented. So, um, if you go back to this simple model, then, here's an MHC molecule. It looks like this in cartoon form. It's got this peptide which is being presented to the receptor, but this is a receptor on the important immune system cell, the T cell, and this receptor will identify whether this cell has an infected um, a virus in there because of presenting this foreign peptide. So this is surveillance of cell health, if you like that, and this is what these proteins are about. So what we did then is we looked at the whole of the um, of the structure of the genome. This is a so-called haplotype. It's a model of the MHC here, and this is a set of genes here, and this region contains some of the genes for these structures which have this crate, this MHC molecule. And you see there are several of them, several here, so-called Cajon molecules, and several so-called Cajon molecules. So it turns out that these genes are encoded in a gene cluster of a few, um, of a, of a five million mega bases long. Yeah. And this structure then is what we think of as a kind of gene cluster. Now, what we found in this gene cluster was that it actually contained these molecules which are presenting peptides to the immune system, but it also contained other genes which were relevant to this whole mechanism for presenting peptides to the immune system. What we found was that there are two genes here in this cluster which encode so-called transporters, peptide transporters. And there's a bit of molecular gymnastics going on here, such that what happens is, if you get a virus infecting the cell, it has to be broken down first by this thing called the proteasome, which is a barrel, if you like, with a hole in the middle. It looks like um, four polar rings, which are kind of little um, circles with holes in the middle. The virus then is forced, the protein is forced from this proteasome, it cleaves them into small chunks. The chunks then get transported by the transporters here and loaded onto these MHC molecules. The molecules then go to the cell surface and present that to the receptor. So some of this machinery then is encoded in this gene cluster. And that was remarkable to us when we discovered this because we found that there was, um, the, the genome then has little territories, if you like, where genes are clustered together which have related functions. So, I mentioned though that these genes are highly variable between the individual. And this just shows you again a schematic of this MHC region. And you see these dots represent uh, variations in these genes. There are huge numbers of different variants, so called alleles of these genes, between different individuals. So, all of you in this room will have different genes uh, encoded in this region. That's why there's a big problem in transplanted tissue between different individuals, because you'll all be different. So the differences, though, lie mostly in this peptide binding group. So here's the barbecue group again, here's the two sausages, and these differences you see tend to be in this region. So what's happening, we believe, is that um, when you have a viral infection, viruses, of course, can mutate very quickly. They can, they can vary very quickly. And so they vary so that actually they escape being recognized by this group, so they don't bind them here. So the human fights back and actually creates additional variants of this group 
but that there will accommodate the robots because it can that mouse game going on here. Virus is changing, and then humans have a huge repertoire of different genetics and molecules so they can cope with these changes in the virus. So I want to underline another point here though that of course this is a very difficult situation to look at. We've got all this variation in different individuals worldwide. How do we cope with this for scientists? And the way this works is that actually we have this so-called HLA workshops, MXC workshops, where every few years or so people get together from worldwide and actually they exchange expertise and reagents. And this first started off actually in 1964 here, um, where people got together and they actually just had a few antiseries that they, they actually checked against each other. Cells were swapped and antibodies were swapped. This continued for several years, several different um, workshops now. And in the end here, we've got these workshops where it's all about DNA and using very high throughput, whole genome sequencing, and modern sequencing techniques in order to type cells. So these workshops though, are an incredibly good example of how important it is to collaborate in science. And the, as I said, the, I've been to several of these, um, and it's always a wonderful experience to see people working together. In this case, there was somewhat forced together because, because you can't work on gene variation because you don't have the sufficient population to look at. You need those populations. And it's, it's an incredibly good example of how people can work together. So it turns out these genes then are involved in presenting peptides from viruses. And they're a major problem for transplants because they vary between the individual. But when we start to look in more detail, we find that these genes are important for other things as well. As well as transplant compatibility, the level of the immune responses that they control, resistance to infection, of course, the specificity of the responding cells, they also regulate pregnancy to some extent, they're involved in autoimmune diseases, and some odd things like mate selection has been proposed, and of course now cancer in the therapy. These are, for many years, people believed that the immune system was irrelevant to cancer. Now, it's, it's center stage in that actually it's clear that if you can actually use these molecules uh, to advantage, you can actually um, leverage um, these cancer cells, these T cells, to attack tumors and you can some spectacular advances in the melanoma molecules. So here's this MHC region again, this gene cluster, and we can map these genes then to particular um, diseases. And you see there's a large number of different conditions, diseases then associated with this region. So um, the way you do this is you take um, a group of individuals with a particular disease, you take a group of individuals suffering from controls that don't have that condition, and you look to see which variants fit in two different categories. And if you find one variant more common in the disease population, then there's a very strong hint that that actually is related, it's got something to do with that disease. And as I say, it turns out that all autoimmune diseases, I believe, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, celiac disease, or whatever, all of these diseases are associated with this MHC region. There's other diseases, um, viral infection, of course, and some cancers, bacterial infection, also associated. So it's a rich gold mine, if you like, to look at this region in terms of the um, association of humans with the disease. So, <clears throat> I don't know my cops actually, I don't want to go this one. I'm not happy. I'm okay? Yeah, yeah. Good. So here's the MEC molecule then. This is this flag which is actually presenting, this cell is stressed, it's saying I've got an viral infection. I'm going to present a bit of that virus to these T cells and we're going to respond appropriately. But it's even more complicated than that. There are other receptors here that are also seeing this MHC molecule. And so the MHC molecule is the center stage. It's telling you the cell's got a problem, and it's being picked up by a number of different receptors. And we've been looking at these other receptors on so-called natural killer cells. 
And these also um, bind to NBC class one molecule. Here's an actual killer cell, and you can see that it's this the target, you're binding to that target, and it's killing the target. And um, we've been looking at some of these receptors from actual killer cells, and these are so-called key, key receptors. And these modulate the development and function of natural killer cells through interaction with these NHC molecules. And it turns out that like NHC molecules, these key receptors are incredibly diverse, so they differ between different individuals. So, they also are present in gene clusters, the so-called leukocyte receptor complexes. So here's another region of the genome, it's on chromosome 19 now, this is on chromosome 6, the NHC, this is on chromosome 19. And these key receptors are all present, present in a cluster on chromosome 19 in this cluster in the complex. So, what we're finding, as I say, is that these genes for these proteins are incredibly variable as well as NHC. And so here we've been looking at European populations, and this is this just shows you some of the most frequent variant so-called habitat gene clusters. Um, present in Europeans. And you see there are several of these where genes in this case are the varying the sequences, but also they're missing some individuals. So some individuals have more genes and some have less. And we found individuals some have only four of these genes and others have 18 or more. So it's incredibly diverse. It's like a kind of constantine if you like throughout right, evolution. You get a lot gain and loss of genes, presumably in response to infection. We're looking at other populations now. This is some, some from the Gambia. And you can see in Africa, in the Gambia at least, again there's additional variation. So in response, presumably to different in conditions of their infections, or whatever it may be, again people vary in the gene complement. Um, and um, so we've got a situation worldwide where we see these are MHC genes here. We can map out different variants worldwide into different countries, different populations. And again, in the receptors, these key genes, again, if you can map worldwide, different populations have different, um, different sequences. Uh, time, time up? Five minutes? Okay. <laughs> okay. I've lost all track of time. <laughs> so, we have a situation here where we have MEC molecules which are highly poly polymorphic and on chromosome 6. And we have the receptor which are highly polymorphic and on chromosome 19. So you can't choose who your parents are, as you know. Um, maybe possibly in the future, but you can't <laughs> that. So we have a situation where you, you give these genes from your parents and they vary, and some are 19 and some are 6. And so it's a lottery which you'll get. And so they don't always fit together with each other. You've got, you've got these ligands here and receptors, and they don't always match. And we think that's a particular problem when it comes to disease association. We start to map these different genes down, we look in these different disease populations, and we're finding that some mismatches are like pre exposure to various diseases. A lot of diseases have been looked at, autoimmune diseases, reproduction, transplantation, cancer, infection, and they all, uh, um, uh, they all, that this mechanism that these MHC molecules interacting with the key receptors actually influences all of these diseases. I want to just illustrate with one, this is pregnancy here, and this was my boss, Walter Bogman, in actually in the 1950s and 60s, proposed that actually selection uh, for disease resistance is incredibly important, but also its birth rate. If you look at this graph, it shows you the kind of average birth weight down here, but if the, if the child is too, the baby is too large or too small, then it's a particular problem for the mother or for the infant. So it's a very, it's a very selective process. Despite the fact that the world is overpopulated, as I'm sure you're all aware, actually, childbirth is an incredibly difficult process. Those of you who have children will know that certainly the females, and some of the men will appreciate this, not all of them. In fact, it's a very difficult process and it's highly selective. People die in childbirth. And we believe that the genes we're studying is a work from Ashley Moffat, who's a colleague of mine in Cambridge. She proposed that the genes on these kids, receptor genes, 
in relation to the babies um, MHC genes actually propose a particular risk for the for the for childbirth. There's a particular condition called preeclampsia where there's a blood supply to the fetus which is inappropriate. And if you have a particular constellation of these receptor genes and the baby carries a particular MHC gene, then you're at risk for this um, condition. And it may be controlling uh, this birth weight. So this is a problem that we're starting to look at now. Um, in particular, in Uganda, we've got a relationship with the lab in Uganda because actually the, this preeclampsia is incredibly high in Uganda. It's about 10% of births actually have preeclampsia. In Europe, it's about 3%. So we're studying this with a um, group in Uganda. You see the genes are highly variable there. And we've got a program here, and I've put this up because I think it's a good example of the way you can work internationally with groups here in Cambridge and Africa, we have a particular program which is actually building all the time where we actually have a relationship, a very strong relationship with the civil Cambridge Africa program where we work together to study these diseases. And we host uh, 30, 40 different African students and postdocs in the laboratory in Cambridge here working on those problems. And obviously it's, it's a model for how we do international collaborate. So I'm um, looking at other conditions like malaria again in Uganda, and um, this just shows you the, these key genes are highly diverse in these different populations. So I, I should stop, I know I've run out of time, but I should just finish by saying that, remind you that actually where we're working in Cambridge here is the so-called Golden Triangle. Cambridge, Oxford, London have a lot of resources and people and expertise. They're not the only universities in the, the UK that have this kind of expertise, but they actually have a, a, a lion's share, if you like. And we, we really feel privileged that we actually have the, um, the facilities and funding. Cambridge developed from um, uh, about 800 years ago. It was split off from Oxford. They actually they, they fell out with the townspeople in Oxford, so they moved to Oxford, they started a new laboratory in Cambridge. It's, it's full of laboratories, not just the university, but also the so-called Silicon Fen. We don't have any balance, but we have Silicon Fen. <laughs> What's the difference between Fen and Valley? Sorry, Fen? What's the difference between Fen and Valley? Fen and the Valley? What's the difference? The Fen is just a boggy area. <laughs> it's a boggy area. It's a new technology. Yeah, it's different. Yeah, we just have water. <laughs> it's, it's actually drained by the Dutch many years ago. <laughs> it was just, it was just it was full of mosquitoes and Fen. It's still very flat, there's no mountains, and it's just water, and we have to pump it out all the time. So the silicon fan, and it, it's a constellation of different laboratories and research groups here. This is the science centre, which I hope you visit, because we have visited eight miles south of Cambridge. A lot of cluster of different groups. We're a collegiate university where we have all these different colleges. No one understands how the system works, including me. <laughs> 31 different colleges and the university, and they all seem to somehow rub along with each other. Um, I can take you and talk to you at lunchtime about the different colleges. Um, I wanted to, we've had some speakers from the LMV. This is the LMV, and against the Agrobook side. There are many different um, people working in Cambridge, in, in, in of Indian origin. And here's one in the whole panel, and thank you, Rama, Rama Krishnan. And his sister, in fact, worked at the LMV as well in Cambridge. And um, they found a home here where they can actually work, actually, I think, very productively. So you all know it's, it's one of the top-ranking universities. We, we, send, we seem to fight with Oxford. Sometimes we come on top, sometimes they come on top. <laughs> but you notice we're much better than these American yeah, universities. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we don't advertise this very much. Anyway, um, and this is, these are the people, actually, in my laboratory that have worked on this problem with. There's many other people. This is Church King's College. This is Monk who's actually joined my laboratory years ago. And I'm sorry to go over time. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>